I'd like to welcome everyone out tonight for the services. If I could have everyone come on in and have a seat, we'll get started. One of our young men, Merv Prince, is going to uh, lead us in a song, so if everybody grab a songbook and join in. Thank you. <clears throat> We'll be singing the first and third verse of uh, 852 when the roll is called up yonder. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time will be no more and the morning eternal night and fair when the same direction gather over on the other shore and the roll is called up yonder I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder when the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Let us slay before the master from the dawn till setting sun. Let us talk of all his wondrous love and care. Then when all of life is over and our work on earth is done, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there. Thank you, Mark. <clears throat> if you uh, haven't had a chance to pick up a bulletin, please do so before you leave tonight. I'm going to just touch on a couple of these items. Uh, Gail Jett had knee replacement surgery today at Brookwood, and the surgery went well. She should be going home tomorrow or Friday. Um, also, keep uh, Wes and Pam in your prayers for the uh, loss of, of Mia. Wes and Pam and, and Miles, and also Griff, Griffin Webster is continuing to recover from surgery on his ankle. Uh, and we do have a lot of kids down at Backwoods and parents down at Backwoods this week, so certainly remember them in your prayers too. But I'll lead us in a prayer here in just a minute, but are there any other requests, either physically or spiritually, especially spiritually? Let's, uh, let's go to our Father. <clears throat> Holy Father, we are so thankful for what you give us, especially for your Son. We're thankful for this opportunity that we have to come out tonight and to listen to a, to a lesson from your Word. And, and we are thankful for your church and all our brothers and sisters here that meet here at this place and our brothers and sisters that meet throughout the world during the week and also on Sundays. We are thankful that we have our health and we, we do pray that, that those who do not have the health that they desire, that they are able to heal and to, to be able to get back into your service and be able to get about your business. Father, we are uh, grieving here, and, uh, and we've had some deaths here in the last several weeks, and especially this past week, that we are grieving, and we do pray for those. We'll pray for Wes and Pam and Miles and, and the death of little, little Mia, and we, we do pray for them, pray that they're able to, to heal. And, and continue in your faith. We are thankful for the program that we have going on in the summer series tonight That and our speaker, doc, Dr. Edwards, we're thankful for him. We do pray as he brings a lesson that, that it is one that we can use and, and take with us and grow stronger in you. For all those that are down at Backwoods this week, we, we pray for them, pray that they are we know that they're immersed in the Bible this week, and, and we do pray that they can grow stronger. And we know that we baptize a lot down there during the week, but we do pray as, as that happens. 
that that they are also able to grow in you and give them a safe trip back when they come back on Friday. We're thankful that Gail was able to have surgery on her knee and that we do pray that she's able to continue to to heal from that and also Griffin with his feet. Uh, we, we do pray for healing for him. So I know he starts off to college this summer or or some some type of schooling that he's going to this summer for, for a year. We do pray that he's able to heal up for that and be able to get back on his feet. We pray for Chuck as he's up in Carmen Hill and pray, pray that his effort up there is glor glorifying you. Father, again, we're so thankful for your son. It is through his name that we ask this prayer. Those that are fifth grade and under, which I don't think we have many, I'll introduce our speaker here in a few. like to uh, go ahead and introduce our speaker for tonight. It's uh, Dr. Terry Edwards. He uh, serves as a professor for Bible and Humanities at Faulkner University in Montgomery, and he's previously served on the faculties at both Harding University and Freed, uh, Freed Hardeman University. He was a teacher down there when William and Adam was down there. I asked him if he failed them, and he, he couldn't remember. So he's just probably being nice. Uh, he's also the director of Faulkner Study Abroad in the Tuscany program. He grew up on the mission field in Italy, spent a total of 26 years in Italy and Greece, 12 of these in vocational miss mission work. He's been married to Kimberly for 40 years. They have six children, two son-in-laws, two daughter-in-laws, and 15 grandchildren. Mr. Rhodes, he's probably, well, he's probably passed you, hadn't he? Okay, okay. All right, but I'll turn it over to Mr. Edwards. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you. It's my summer series. For nine years I've been doing the summer series for the uh, 
Delrada congregation, and uh, uh, the tragedy of that is that I booked all these wonderful speakers to come in on Wednesday nights, and I was always gone. <laughs> I never got to hear the speakers that I wanted to hear. So anyway, I'm grateful to be uh, invited by Chuck and then by your elders here uh, to be part of the, the evening tonight, and uh, I'm glad I have this opportunity. I have a daughter uh, that has six children just uh, nearby here. Um, I don't remember the section of Birmingham where she lives now, but they attend at River Chase. Uh, anyway, so I've been there several times, but uh, there are many congregations in this hinterland of Birmingham that I've not been to. So you chose to let the speakers of your Wednesday nights choose their favorite sermon. Um, uh, that's, that's, that's good. Um, what you're trying to say is, please bring us the best that you have. <laughs> We'd not like to hear the worst that you have. Uh, if you assign a topic, like I usually do to speakers, you know, the I give them a choice, you know, about 10, take the one, and then uh, pick your date. So I try to get them, but if you sign a, a topic, most of the time they haven't done it before, so they have to... Uh, this one is, uh, I have to explain why I chose it to share it with you. I'm a son of missionaries. I was four, born in Nashville, Tennessee. I sing country music, and I've played with Kenny Rogers on stage one time, so I'll be glad to do some hee-haw for you if you'd like. But I'm also half Italian because my parents took me over to Italy and I spent my junior high, senior high years over there. So I had to go through the European school systems and came back to the States only when I was in college. I'm a son of um, I'm missionaries, so to speak. And when I was 13, I was baptized uh, in the northern Italian city of Pistoia. It was December the 9th and it was very cold. Um, and there are a few congregations in Italy, there are about 35 of them that that have a baptistry, but they did, but they don't have heating. <laughs> it was so cold. I do remember that. I was sure of what I chose. Can you look, think back to your um, baptismal moment, the moment they put on Christ in baptism? When I was 19, six years later, I took a trip by myself. In, in Europe, it's a lot easier to travel. You don't use a car. You use trains and, and planes and boats. And I was in Athens, Greece, which is not that far away. And uh, I walked on uh, to a hill that's right uh, on the outskirts of what used to be the Acropolis. I, uh, it's called Mars Hill, or Areopagus. Maybe you remember it. It's in Acts chapter 17. It was about in the spring of the year 50 that uh, Paul of Tarsus actually got there for the first time in his life. And I sat down there, and I, um, I had to figure out something. The faith that I had uh, acknowledged that I had put on uh, in Christ when I was 13. Was it really mine or was it my parents? Those of us have been blessed to be born, grown up in a Christian family. We're blessed, very blessed. My mother passed away of cancer. My father's still alive, and he was the dean of biblical studies at uh, Freed Hardeman for 25 years. Uh, I am very blessed. Um, but if you come out of that family, you also have to figure out whose faith is it? And so I ask you tonight uh, kind of the same question. Whose faith is it? Uh, is, your, is it yours? And how's it doing? How's your faith doing? What I did uh, as I sat down at the age of 19 is figure out, oh, it's my faith. It's mine. From now on, I don't live in the shadow and the coattails of my mom and dad. Um, from now on, I'm, it's mine. Now, everybody was asking me, since my dad was a preacher and a missionary and a teacher, what are you going to do when you grow up? Are you going to be a preacher? And I would say, no, no. <laughs> I was going to be a rock star. I was going to, you know, make it big in the music industry. Uh, life has a way of shaking things around and turning you back. It is a privilege and an honor to get to teach and to preach. That is the greatest honor. I, I uh, would do it for free, but please don't tell my administrators at Faulkner I actually need that because I have six children and five and 15 grandchildren, so I still need my salary, but I'd do it for free because it's a privilege. It's the greatest job there is by far. I figured that out. It's taken me a few decades, but I'm proud there. And uh, on Mars Hill, in that uh, year, I, I figured out not only my faith, but also discovered a hero. Now, the, the greatest example of humility, of sacrifice, of love, of faith, of obedience, is, of course, Jesus, the Son of God, God that comes down to earth. That's the greatest example of all, the Christian attributes, virtues, etc. But there are some times when we need some human models, too. Not that Jesus wasn't. Jesus was 100% human and 100% divine. He's both. But it was Paul that I discovered on that 
sitting on that rock hill. And it is my privilege to take groups. I had a group of uh, 45 this past spring that I took to Mars Hill as we live in Italy and we travel to Israel for eight days in Greece and go through the footsteps of the Apostle Paul in Turkey. So it's my privilege. So tonight, what I'd like you to do is open your Bibles to Philippians chapter 1. I will have the text, the ESV translation on the screen. You're welcome to follow it. But if you would, I'd like you to have that in your lap too so that if I'm giving some background material or details that are less interesting to you, you can simply make Philippians chapter 1 yours again tonight. Take this text and make it come alive for you. This is what I'm going to try to do. Paul, Paul of Tarsus. Of the many that were chosen, uh, he was not better than anybody else. In fact, I will remind you, as I remind myself, Paul of Tarsus was a murderer. He had on his conscience even though he was sincere when he did it. He thought he was serving God. He had the lives of women and children and, and adults that he put to death as he arrested them in the years from when he started uh, doing that in Jerusalem to when he took a trip to Damascus and suddenly his life changed on the dime in about three seconds flat. He was blind for three days. He already knew God. He just needed to discover Jesus. And he saw him on that road to Damascus, Acts chapter 9, Acts chapter 22, Acts chapter 26. Three chapters of the book of Acts tell about the same story. Why do you need three times? Not because the soul of the, or the man is more important than my soul or yours to God, but because of the effect that one man can have, one woman can have on the kingdom of God if they will simply get it. Get passion and get it. He had three days of blindness. By the way, in my reading of Acts chapter 9, he was not saved during those three days. He knew who Christ was. He was not just a carpenter, a construction guy from a little town of Nazareth of 400 people. He was the Messiah, the one, the Son of God. What he discovered in three seconds flat. Who are you? I am the one whom you are persecuting. How long does it take to say that in Hebrew? I'm the one whom you are persecuting. Three seconds. And then, oh, you can be 100% sincere like Paul was and 100% wrong. Watch out. <laughs> you can be sincere and wrong. And tragically, a lot of people in this world are. They think they're serving Christ. They think they're... Um, uh, modeling a church, but they're not getting their blueprint, and they're not getting their, their Jesus from the historical biblical texts. They're getting it from somebody else, some other version of Jesus, some other version of church. You can be sincere and wrong. Paul was, and he found out, and he had three days in blindness to figure it out. Okay, what are you going to do now? What are you going to do now? That was about in the year 34 AD, by my best estimations. And, uh, but he came out after three days, and he was given sight again. By the way, when you're blind, I know because I had an accident, I was blind for a while, and your other senses just go, explode, and go 500 miles per hour. You're hearing, you're, you're thinking, you're, you're, you're stuck in your head. And I know what he was doing. He was thinking, now what do I do? What on earth do I do? I can't fix what I did. I can't bring back those people. He arrested people. He broke up families. He took children from their mothers. He did it sincerely. He thought they were not of God, so he was doing what he thought was the will of God, but he was wrong. He was wrong. And when he came out after three days, he lived the rest of his life. He had been going 185 miles per hour in the wrong direction, and then he was on a dime in three seconds three days, turned around, and now you need to run your life this way for the rest of your life. He doesn't know it, that he's going to live about 30 more years. He doesn't know it. There are two parts to Paul's life. The first 30, when he was training, he was on the Supreme Council. He was on the Sanhedrin. He was on the top 70. His career was going great. His parents were so happy with him. They had sent him to Jerusalem to college to study with the greatest Pharisee school of Gamaliel. And he had... Uh, done excellently and he was probably set to get married usually they were they got married after that but he never did he never did he was the only unmarried apostles 
as we can tell. Paul says in one of his letters, 1 Corinthians, uh, don't, can't I take a wife like all the rest of the apostles? He's the only one that never will because, boy, when he takes off, going in the right direction for Christ, speaking for Jesus as the Messiah, he goes 185 miles per hour and just doesn't have time to family and wife and all the rest. He's not trying to make up what he may did wrong before. What he's trying to do is from now on serve. And that's where you are in the year 61. You are 27 years into that. Well, the only thing I can do with the days that I have is live out to the best of my ability all the talents and, and opportunities that I have. When you open up the letter of Philippians, it's the year 61. By all accounts, it's one of four prison epistles. And the prison epistles are, of course, Philippians, Ephesians, Colossians, and Philemon. And uh, those were written, uh, in my estimation, between the year 60 and 62 AD, while he's uh, waiting, as you see in the last verse of the book of Acts, he's waiting for his trial. He's in trouble with the law, with Roman authorities. And he's in a rented house in the largest city in the world, the capital of the world, capital of power, of economy, and of everything else. Nobody had ever seen in that ancient culture a city of two million people like Rome. Rome was in charge of everything now. Their legions, 29 of them, are going to keep conquering for another 60 years, and finally they're going to stop. But they own everything. In the world of that time, there are 80 million people, and Rome owns all of them. The only ones they don't have is the Celts up north. And they're going to keep going and try to take them and the Dacians and a few others. But besides that, Rome is everywhere. Rome came to Palestine in the year 63 before Christ. Paul is said to be of Tarsus, which is not in Palestine. It's actually in the dispersion. It's a city that's on the lower part of Turkey today, north of Antioch of Syria. Paul was an Orthodox Jew from an Orthodox conservative family in a city outside of Palestine, but his parents sent him down to get education. It must have cost him a pretty penny in tuition at the school of Gamaliel, the school of Pharisees. Out of 6 million Jews in the world at that time, there were only about 12 to 18,000 that can say the word, I am, not I was, by the way, a Pharisee. I am of the sect of Pharisees. They were the most revered sect of all the Jewish sects. The Sadducees were aristocrats and wealthy, and uh, they were the ones that controlled the temple, and they uh, had that kind of power. But the Pharisees were the ones that the people thought of as godly and, and pursuing godliness and knowing the Old Testament, knowing scriptures by memory, and being devoted to, to faith in Yahweh, in God. That's who Paul was and is. You'll notice that when he talks about his past, and he has to do it all of the time, every time he comes up to a synagogue of Jews in his travels, when he's apostle of Jesus Christ, gets that job on the road to Damascus directly from Jesus, he will have to say, okay, who are you? And he has to say in, you know, two minutes flat, I am, you know, quick biography, <laughs> short, <laughs> uh, I am a Jew, I am a Pharisee, and I uh, studied with Gamaliel, and I am an apostle of Jesus Christ. That's who I am. Never reneges his Judaism. He never forces his Judaism on you either. He does stuff still that doesn't conflict with his Christian faith, like, for example, cut his hair off one time in Sincrea after the end of a vow, which he makes somewhere in the city of Corinth. Probably a prayer to God, God help me get through this hard mission work here in this city. Well, Philippians. It's the year 61, and four years before, by all accounts, he was accused falsely when he came back from the third missionary journey of having taken a Gentile into the wrong courtyard of the temple. Everybody knew the rules. Thirteen acres. The temple in Jerusalem, the second temple, was huge, and it was administered by the temple guards under the command of the Sadducees and the high priest. And there are spots you come up 16 entrances to the, in that temple and you can come in as a non-jew and you only can go so far and then there's a sign it says no uncircumcised no gentiles passed here penalty of death the romans 
who reserve for themselves normally the right to penalty to death, let the Jewish leadership put that sign there. And they meant it. This is not, we're not kidding. I tried to tell a student one time when we were in the Sistine Chapel that the Vatican guards are kind of persnickety about taking pictures of Michelangelo's ceiling. You can't take them. It's forbidden. I tell them, you better listen to me once. One of them didn't. He tried to do a picture from here. Vatican guards arrested him, and I let him spend some time chatting with Italian and Swiss Vatican guards so he would learn the lesson. When they say, no Gentiles pass here, they mean it. Paul would have never done it. Why would Paul take a Gentile with him in the wrong courtyard? He was accused falsely, but he just about died dragged out by furious, angry mob of, of Jews. They were actually instigated by some Jews that had not converted to the faith in Christ, who were from Ephesus, where Paul had just spent three years there, and they didn't like Paul. When you meet Paul, you either like him or you don't. He's kind of like one of those guys you can tell from the way he writes. We have 13 letters of his in the New Testament. Of all the apostles, he's the one that we know the most about in his biography and his writings. He would come up behind you and give you a big bear hug, and you either liked it or you didn't. Either way, what you see is what you get. No facade, no pretense. You know his faith is genuine. Now, you either go with him or you don't. Well, what you can't do is accuse him of doing it for the money. <laughs> he could take off his robe and show you all the scars he's got. See 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Why would anybody do that? To get famous or powerful or popular? No, 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 no. I uh, noticed all the times that he was beaten with rods. He was uh, uh, left once in Lystra for dead because he was thrown in a, in a trash pit and, and they thought they had crushed his skull and killed him and they didn't think, God, no, you don't do that for the money or the power or the prestige or anything. Um, in the year 61 is, is in a bend of the Tiber River that flows through the capital of Rome uh, that, uh, that today is uh, tight streets and, and, and antique shops and things like that. But back then, there were seven, eight-story high. I don't know what you thought of ancient Rome, but it had seven, eight-story high buildings and probably maybe, let's suppose for a minute, in the eighth, seventh, eighth story, he finally gets instructions from them. They don't have GPSs and smartphones. So how on earth did Epaphroditus see Philippians chapter? Chapter 2, from Philippi, that's a thousand miles away in northern Macedonia. How did he find Paul? How on earth did he find Paul in a house, in an apartment, in a city of two million people? How did he do that? I don't know. But the knock came on the door, and Paul may have opened it. He was under house arrest. It meant he can't go out without a guard attached to him. He has a guard assigned to him every single day. They don't have chains on while they're in the house, but if they have to be transported, they are. I don't know if he recognized Epaphroditus. I don't know if he converted them. Paul was there in Philippi twice in his life when he started the congregation and later when he visited during the third missionary journey. But he's been gone for the last five years. And the brethren at Philippi have not seen him for five years. Imagine this. Chuck never came back. <laughs> I'm just teasing. Okay? And he's, where'd he go? No means of communication. And then finally one day it says, he's in Rome. He's in trouble. He's waiting for Roman trial. There are only two outcomes to Roman trial. I hope you know them. They don't have prison terms. They don't put people in prison for five years or 10 or 15. They don't have police and sheriff department. What they got is military. And military has one purpose. It's to destroy. <laughs> well, and that's what uh, they do. Let one of the Praetorian Guard is assigned to him every day, the best crack forces of the Roman imperial troops to him every day until he appears before the most powerful man in the world in the year, in the year uh, 62 AD. Uh, his name is Claudius Aquinas Barbus, or you can call him Nero. Nero goes down as the most vicious emperor ever in the history of the Roman Empire. And by the way, he came to power when he was 16 in the year 54, and in 61, seven years later, he's only 23 years old, and he's owned the world for seven years now, and he even got rid of his mother because she was in the way. She had her killed, and his stepbrother, and the list goes on and on. Sometime next week, or in the next month, Paul of Tarsus is going to go before this 23-year-old called Nero. 
when A&E made a series on the most evil people in the world, number one was Satan, number two was Nero. <laughs> I don't know if they're right or not, but if you read the accounts by Tacitus of what Nero did when he was a teenager and then what he did as an adult, you go, wow, what a time to be living. And he's going to judge you? How on earth are you going to get justice out of a man like that? Man, he's not a man. This is what's happening next week. And this is the context of Philippians 1. And that's what makes it absolutely amazing that um, the tone of this letter called Philippians, which is a thank you letter, Epaphroditus made a thousand mile journey, had to go by foot, had to go by boat, maybe donkey, took him months to get there, and he got sick along the way. He just about died. He was evidently very sick when he knocked on that door. Paul thought he was going to die. Paul cannot use his uh, miraculous powers to heal Epaphroditus. You'll notice that miraculous powers are signs of who you are. You can't just use them indiscriminately. And Paul will give thanks in this letter that God let Epaphroditus live through because he sacrificed to bring a gift from the Philippians to Paul because they just found out where he's been for five years and now they're worried sick. Somebody they love dearly is in big trouble. There's only two outcomes for a Roman trial. Two outcomes. And the second one, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. The second one is just daunting. I want to read this with you and look at context. So some archaeology, and then let you take encouragement from it. So this is how the letter starts. If he's dictating it, Paul didn't have uh, uh, ink and uh, animal skin vellum, so you had to purchase it from scribes that were on the street. You would come up and you would dictate to them. Sometimes Paul had his own scribes to which he would dictate. Paul will take the quill at the end of some letters and sign it on his own. You always have a five-part um, way of writing letters in the first century A.D., and Paul is the most educated of the apostles, and he also writes in the format of a first century educated person. First of all, you put your name at the front, not at the end. You don't sign it. Secondly, the addressees to whom the letter is written. Thirdly, you, put, you could say uh, prayers and thanksgivings. Now, most people are pagan, so they give thanksgivings to, to the gods. Paul has one God. He's a monotheist. He will give thanks to God. And then comes the purpose of the letter. And the purpose of Philippians is thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And then some instructions in between that. Thank you for your gift. Thank you for remembering me. Thank you for caring. Thank you for sending Epaphroditus. Um, the word rejoice appears 16 times in verb form or adjective or some other form. It is staggering to think that he could be sentenced to death next week. And this is the mood, the emotions of Paul of Tarsus uh, when he gets this knock on the door from Epaphroditus and he immediately writes down this letter. And he starts like this. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. His name when he was born, Orthodox Jew, was Saul. But uh, there is a unique feature about Paul of Tarsus. His father had Roman citizenship. Orthodox Jew had Roman citizenship. Where did he get it? The only way to get Roman citizenship, which is expensive, you can buy it. But uh, either you're born to somebody who already has it, or you buy it with a lot of money, or you render a service to imperial Rome. Now, supposing that uh, the family of Paul was probably wealthy, I'm saying that because the tuition at uh, the school of Gamaliel was significant. So let me, let me suggest to you that Paul, he will say in his letter, I've known wealth and I've known nothing in my bank account. He will say, I've known both ends of things. And by the way, happiness doesn't lie in either one of those. <laughs> okay? He will say money, uh, but the world thinks it's there. But I think Paul had money. I think Paul lost all his connections to his family business, money, when he sent an email home that said, uh, I've decided here in Ant in, uh, in Damascus to now follow and be a leader in the sect of the followers of the way of Jesus of Nazareth. I think his family wrote him off from that point on. 
We never hear of his mom or dad. We hear of his sister's son that saves his life when he's in trouble in Jerusalem. So we know he has a sister in Jerusalem, and that's about it. Where do you get the name Paul? That's not a translation of Saul. Paul is his Roman name. When he was born, they had 30 days as parents after they circumcised him on the eighth day. Saul is after the tribe that he's from the tribe of Benjamin. Saul is the greatest figure in the tribe of Benjamin. He's proud of the tribe of Benjamin, he says. Circumcised on the eighth day. Hebrew of Hebrews, he will say. I am, I can trace my ancestry, my DNA, straight spiritually, physically. How about you? You know, do you know where you come from? I do. And he will, he will say, my name is Saul, to somebody that's in a synagogue. Ah, you're from the tribe of Benjamin. Yes, my parents named me after King Saul, the first king of Israel, a thousand years before. But my Roman name is Paul, because as he travels as apostle of Jesus Christ, the, the guy that's on the Supreme Council, he's a Supreme Court judge of the Jews, is told by God, told by Jesus, he wants to be his apostle to the Gentiles. <laughs> that seems strange, but Paul never objects. He says, okay. And he uses his... Uh, Greek. He's fluent in Greek. He probably learned it when he was a teenager in Tarsus. There was a university there. But Gamaliel, probably at school, allowed him to do that. He could quote two versions of the Old Testament Bible by memory without a smartphone. And he could quote Greek poets and Greek tragedians. Now, where on earth did he learn those by memory? Where did he learn them? You see, it depends on the audience you got. You know, I can quote scripture with y'all, hopefully. We're in a church building. Hopefully you are interested. But if I'm in a different context overseas, if I'm with Muslims or with uh, Iranians, as I was back in March, uh, they come from Islam. And uh, scripture, you've got to talk about Jesus and his teachings and biography. What you can't do is quote Philippians chapter 1 verse 7. <laughs> That's not going to play out. Paul looked at his audience and could, could do that. See his Athens speech, Athens 17, to a bunch of Greek PhDs of the time. Timothy was one of his beloved ones. He didn't have any children. Paul is his Greco-Roman name, and Timothy is, boy, he picked him up just a few months before, and by 61, uh, before in, in Philippi, before Philippi, his first visit, and in 61, Timothy's been with him now for 11 years. Off and on, he sent him on. Timothy, I don't know how old he is, but he's late 20s, early 30s. And Timothy has been remarkably mature from the very beginning, an amazing companion of his. Paul and Timothy, who's writing this letter? Paul is. Timothy is looking over his shoulder. P Timothy is his companion. P Timothy is the guy that he's training to take over when he dies. It's the year 61. You and I know Paul has four more years of life. He doesn't know that. He thinks next week. You and I take for granted that you know, tomorrow is going to come up for us. And next year next year going to be here. But we don't have any assurances of that. Paul definitely didn't. And he was training, mentoring. Timothy and Titus were his two favorite ones. He will write to them and send them out. And he will have many others. And by the way, he l travels always with a bunch of people. He hates being alone. He is not married, but he hates being alone. He's gregarious. He loves company, two or more. And he says, Timothy is looking over my shoulder, and he was with him in Philippi when they started that congregation. And he says, Timothy's right here, and we are servants of Christ Jesus. Paul could use his title. He could say, I'm Dr. Paul. I am an um, uh, apostle. I have authority you don't have from Christ. Instead, he's going to say so many times, I am the greatest of sinners, the least of the apostles. That's what he's going to say. And he will prefer not to say, remind you that he's an apostle with authority. He doesn't want to. He will do it when he has to. See the Colossian letter. They have a problem. They're teaching heresy. And so he lets them, reminds them, hey, this is not opinion. This is <laughs> from God. Okay? So please understand, uh, you don't have, you can not take it or leave it here. See the letter of Colossians. Here, the Philippian church is one of the best, if not the best, the most joyous one work he's ever. He loves this church. I hope you, you love this church. I hope you have, when you're gone for a while, you can't wait to get back. He had been gone from them for five years. 
He had been with them a few weeks the first time, and then he'd been back with them maybe a couple of weeks the second time, but he missed them, and he had been constrained by this arrest for false charge for four years, and he didn't know if he was going to get out next week. Servants. I'm just a servant. Doulos in Greek. I'm just a servant of Jesus Christ. Forget titles. You know, slavery was an endemic thing of the first century. More people were enslaved in Paul's time than ever in the history of the world. If you walked in most cities, Corinth, Alexandria, Egypt, Rome, one out of two people on the sidewalk was a slave. In the countryside, less, but in the cities, one out of two. There was 35 to 40 percent of the population that were slaves for various reasons. So this, this is a very sensitive word, you know. And Paul says, I am a voluntary slave. That's what a Christian is. A follower of Christ is a voluntary slave of Jesus Christ. Nobody made you. Nobody made me. I want to serve Christ. That's what I want to do. To all the saints of Christ Jesus, that's, that's slaving people. My Catholic friends and my Greek Orthodox friends, they're wrong. The word saint is not used ever by Paul in a sense of somebody that's already dead and a committee in Rome has to proclaim them saints. And you can pray to them for yourself and light a candle. That's a tragic thing that has happened in the last 2,000 years. When Paul uses the word saint, selected, put apart, set apart, holy people, he's talking about living people. You and I are not perfect. We need the blood of Christ, the salvation that's brought to us, but we are saints by the blood of Christ, and that's what the Philippians are. And then he mentions the only letter ever that Paul does this to the leadership. Yes, elders and deacons are the only way, and all encyclopedias or historical accounts will tell you there was no pope in the first century. There was no patriarch. There were independent churches, Jerusalem, Antioch of Syria, Iconium, Lystra, Derby, Jerusalem, and they had elders. See Acts chapter 14 when Paul and Barnabas go back through the churches and appoint elders and deacons. In Philippi, that had only been around for 11 years, there were elders and deacons. Those are the leadership that is there. Grace to you and peace from God our Father. Paul always begins and usually ends with his favorite two blessings when he writes, when he speaks. I'm sure he did it too. Grace. Charis in English. That's free, 100% free. Can't earn a single bit of it. Your salvation, you can't earn a single item of it. It's called grace. That's what the blood of Jesus bought. Peace. Um, shalom. He would say in his language, Hebrew, Shalom. Irene in Greek. He was fluent in both. And uh, this is what he, he says. This is a map. You can't see it. It's too far. But way up at the top, you see it's Macedonia in the left-hand corner. That's where Philippi was. Now, off the map that way, about 1,000 miles of Rome where Paul is, but he, he does, must remember when he's writing this letter, dictating it, that uh, uh, the first time he went there 11 years ago, it was on the second missionary journey. It was about the year 50 when he went uh, all the way through what we call Turkey today. And then he was trying, I think, to go to Ephesus, a big city, and the Holy Spirit said no. And then he tried to go north to Bithynia, and uh, the Spirit of Jesus said no. And that's one of the few times that Paul was told not to go somewhere. So he ended up in Troas. I don't know if you can see us on the Turkish coast today. It's ancient Troy where Achilles or you know Brad Pitt died, You know, if you know that movie. Troy. So let me imagine for a second. He's sitting in Starbucks in Troy, Troas, wondering, okay, well, now where did I go? My suspicion is he hated to get on the sea. He's a land guy. Have you ever been on a boat? You know, in ancient times, you didn't sail between uh, October and February. Your odds were like 50-50 that you'd become fish food. I don't think Paul would like the sea. I think he probably would have loved to have drama mean. But if you're going to get anywhere, you've got to go by sea. And then he has that Macedonian call. A guy from Macedonia says, come over. That's why I think he didn't want to go there. He was wondering, okay, where do I go now? I've run out of land. I don't know where to go. And Jesus, God, appears and, and says through the Macedonian call, get on a boat. Now, he gives him a nice trip. It only takes a day and a half to get to the little port of Neapolis. And then five miles in, for the first time, he came to the city of, of, of uh, 
Philippi. Philippi today is still there. Well, the ruins of it. It was a mid medium-sized city back then. This is where the congregation of the Philippians is and where Paul started this work back in the year 50 A.D. and now it's 61. He must have thought back to 11 years before. This is the uh, 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 major road. The Romans got it from the Persians. They got the idea of if you're going to have a big empire, you've got to build roads, communication systems. Major reason for roads is for armies to quickly deploy from one spot to the rest. And then, if you're a civilian, you can use it too. Paul used it. When you're given a task like the 11 apostles were, uh, now I want you, said Jesus, when, before he ascended into heaven, Acts chapter 1, this is your job now for the rest of your life. You're to take what I taught you for the last three years, and you're to take it where? Where are you to take it? Acts chapter 1, verse 8. To Jerusalem? Okay, I can do that. All of Judea, okay, I think I can do that. And then what's that third one? To the ends of the, say what again? Can I hear that last part again? We don't have, we don't have internet. We don't have planes. We don't have helicopters. You want 11 guys that were fishermen and tax collectors. Paul joins that group of apostles, and here's your job description. I want you to go to... 80 million people in the world. <laughs> but instead of Paul arguing, how on earth am I supposed to do that? He makes a plan. So he didn't stop in small towns. He only went to big towns because he figured if he could plant the faith in Jesus Christ in a town that uh, economy and people commerce and people traveling would take it and would spread out. Kind of like if you squish a pregnant spider. Have you ever done that? It's a mistake, by the way. Don't do it. You kill the mama, but you have thousands of spiderettes that go everywhere. <laughs> My wife did it last week. I told her, don't do it. That's what the Jews did. They thought when they started persecuting Christians, Acts chapter 8, they started persecuting the, the Christians in Jerusalem. Guess what Acts chapter 8 and verse 1 says? And boom, the persecuted Jews started heading out everywhere, and they took their faith with them. And that was exactly what they did not want. Oh, no. Yeah. Paul, his plan was, I'm going to go to cities. So he didn't preach in Neapolis. And if you read the book of Acts, you will see he goes through Amphipolis, Apollonia. He goes through a bunch of cities, and he doesn't stop. But he gets to a city like Philippi, and he goes on the Ignatian Road here, and he's going to stay on this major highway here that connects Philippi with the biggest city of, of that, that side of the world, Macedonia, Thessalonica, and then go on to Berea. And I think he was going to probably keep going until he hit the Adriatic Sea. But he couldn't do that. It was uh, uh, something he couldn't do. This is the Ignatian Road where Paul traveled. Something he didn't know that had happened 91 years before, it was the battle. It's the battle between Roman legions. There was a civil war going on, and Mark Anthony... Every spring, I... I try to ask the Greek farmers, what have you found? Gladius, have you found a helmet? Have you found a coin? Have you found a belt? Because thousands of Romans died in those fields. See, what happened 91 years before Paul came into Philippi was, it was a Greek city, but there was a major battle between Roman forces, and when it was all over, the winners simply said to all the Greeks in the city, you need to go move. And so when Paul came in there, First time he's been in Greece. He speaks Greek fluently. Imagine if you could speak French fluently and I gave you a plane ticket to Paris. How excited would you be? Or if you could speak Italian fluently and I give you the most beautiful city in the world, my city, Florence. You know, What if I get to go to Florence I speak Italian? He gets to go to Greece for the first time in his life and he speaks Greek fluently. And he gets there and he finds, hello, why are all the doorbells, why are all the... Statues, not in Greek, but in, in Latin. Why is that the case? We're going to come back to that in a second. What he finds in Philippi is very strange. Everywhere he goes, Roman colonies even, he goes to six of them in the world that he travels in, um, have synagogues. And that is how he gets to the Greco-Roman Greco Gentiles. He goes to a Jewish synagogue. He sees the Greco-Roman uh, that are Gentiles that are already worshiping the one true God of Israel, and then all he has to do is give them the missing piece of the puzzle, which is Jesus, the construction guy from Nazareth. He was the Messiah. The Jewish leadership in Jerusalem 
reneged, reneged on him, denied him, arrested him, crucified him, but he came back. And he is the Messiah. That's the peace that he, that he has to give. And that's why I show you a picture of a little teeny rivulet called Chrenides, which is just outside of the ruins of Philippi. There's this one instance in all the travels of Paul where he can't use his favorite methodology. Go to a synagogue, see who's sitting on the back, back pews. That would be the Greco-Romans uh, that, are, that are worshiping in the synagogue. They wouldn't let them up front. They were kind of like second-class believers. They would make them sit on the back, and those are the ones he wants to talk to so he can get a foothold into their families and preach to the Gentiles. That is the way in which he does it. You may remember there's no synagogue in, um, in Philippi because 91 years before, the Romans had kicked all the Greeks and the Jews that were there out. It takes, by the way, 10 Jewish men that have done their bar mitzvah, age 13 and above, to have a synagogue. You can't have one otherwise. That's the rule. There's no synagogue in Philippi. So where am I going to find people that want to pray and talk about spiritual things? Where on earth am I going to find them? In the marketplace? Walmart? Of the time, noisy, people have come there to give a gallon of milk, probably not. So he goes out by the river outside the city, and this is where he encounters a woman called Lydia, who was a merchant woman that sold purple cloth done from the dye of, of matter plant roots. This is the Crenidus. This is what he would remember as well. He would remember while the Roman provincial administration. By the way, this big thing you see down on the ground was way up top on a huge building. It's kind of like saying City Hall. It had a, you know, it was a big sign right there um, that said the province of Macedonia. It was Roman. It was like a Roman colony. It was like a little Rome. We're in Greece. It's his first experience with Greece, and he sees very, very much that Latin is everywhere. Here is one of 113 different columns. They don't have Greek on it. They have Latin. So he must have turned maybe to Luke. He was traveling with Silas, Luke, and Timothy, and asked Luke, listen, do you know why Latin is here everywhere? Why that is the case? He will marvel at the... Oh, the marble streets and marble columnated roads and Philippi was wealthy and rich and, and was and uh, but what he is never impressed with is he's not a tourist he's there for people there are 30,000 souls and so while we don't have direct evidence that he did it here in these stones that you see here in Philippi there's one of them it's called Bima Bima is the speaker's stone you could talk about everything in Roman society except politics. You see, Rome was in charge. It was settled. We don't have democratic elections, so we're not going to talk about that. But you can talk about sports. You can talk about religion. You can talk about anything else. So they would get up on the stone, and there would be some kooks. And Paul's accused of being a kook by the uh, Greek uh, philosophers in Athens when he gets on the bima in that particular uh, case there. I don't know if in the weeks he was there he went to the theater, it's their version of Netflix, you know. Before there was Netflix and TV, there was theater. The Greeks invented it. This is, seats about 8,000 people. That's how we know how big Philippi was when Paul was there. Uh, but he refers to, <coughs> uses words in his language about theater and theatrical productions. Even Jesus does. Jesus probably saw some Greek productions in the city nearby of Sepphoris, four miles from the city of Jerusalem. Maybe Jesus, when he was working there, even helped construct one of those theaters. He definitely thinks back to this. Well, I don't know if it's this or not, but today a guide will tell you this is the place where Paul and Silas were in prison for a night, and there was an earthquake. Do you remember that? There was a girl that was had a spirit of divination, and when Paul, after three days of putting up with it, uh, cast out that spirit because he had that power as an apostle, I'm sure he thinks back to that girl, and I wonder what happened to her, and this is uh, the night that they were beaten uh, and put in, cast in, uh, in stocks. Uh, by the way, neither one of them should have been. By Roman law, it's illegal to uh, do that. But what the authorities there in Philippi didn't know, because they didn't ask, you wouldn't happen to have Roman citizenship with you. You see, they didn't have plastic laminated <laughs> ID cards. You had three words that you said. Because... Uh, he would have been given a certificate, so to speak, made out of terracotta when he was 30 days old. You had to register your child who had a right to Roman citizenship. 
you would give them a certificate. But, you know, who, who's carrying around a terracotta <laughs> thing there? So you say three words. And by the way, if you say these three words and you don't have the right to, the penalty is take a wild guess. The Romans didn't mess around. Okay? Chivis Romano Sum. I am a Roman citizen. You say those words, Paul will say them once, and a Roman commander will say, a uh, Roman centurion will say, uh, wait a minute. And he goes to his commander, the commander comes back and he says, my centurion thinks that he heard you say Chivis Romano Sum. Um, you may remember that if you say these words without the right to, you're dead. You may buy three months or six months, but once you find out, Paul will say, no, I got mine from my dad. The commander will say, I had to pay a lot of money for mine. And you can just about see Paul go, oh, I got mine free from dad. And we have to wonder, how did his father or grandfather get it? Maybe they made tents for the Romans. That's what my suggestion is. I want you to see, and then I'll go to the text, and, and I'm about out of time. But there are congregations that will be there. Paul has no idea. Four centuries later, a city that's totally devoted to gods and, and to pagan gods, that's church buildings of Christian churches that are built four centuries after Paul, Silas, and Timothy, and Luke are there. You're looking at church buildings that are there. And now I want to quickly read the text of Philippians 1. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in my prayer of mine and for you, all making my prayer with joy. It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart. You are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment, the defense, and confirmation of the gospel. The feeling that Paul has for the congregation is, wow, 11 years later, you just bring joy to my heart. I thank God all the time for you. Do you thank God for your church and prayer? The prayer life of Paul is apparent. He didn't just say, I'll pray for you. He actually does it. You'll find in every letter of his a written out prayer, if not two. You know that he prays, and you know what he prays as well. He, he's, he prays the specifics. He says, I hold you in my heart. You are, we're on the same team, you and I. Even if I live in Wetumpka, you live in, in uh, Birmingham, we're on the same team. He will say that, and say that from a thousand miles of distance. For God is my witness, how I yearn to all with all. It is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and discernment. See here, please, in these verses, the specifics of what he prays for. They know some stuff, but they need to know more. You need to discern. You need to, in these complicated times we live in, discerning truth from falsehood is a hard task. But you and I are tasked with our intelligence and our rationality to, to carefully, individually, is this speaker, is this preacher, is this teacher saying the right thing or not? I am not inspired by God. <laughs> All I can do is refer to the text. It's your job to figure it out. They were worried. He knows that. Epaphroditus told them they were worried sick about you. You're, and he says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has already served to advance the gospel so it has become known throughout the imperial guard. He says, can you believe it? I get to share my faith every single day with a secret service of the emperor, Praetorian Guard. Can you imagine the barracks back home? Every time they're assigned every day, who'd you get today? I got Paul of Tarsus. Oh, no. He's going to preach to you all day. <laughs> He's going to. Oh, no. And if you get him again a second time, you're going, oh, no. <laughs> I got him again. Can you imagine the guards that are assigned to him? Because he was impassioned about his faith. I am, for the sake of time, going to simply get to this at the end and let you go. Um, go to this verse. Next week, his trial may come up before Nero. And he's either going to die or he's going to live. It's going to be, it's really two buttons on the desk. The judge, Nero, has two, de two buttons. And in spite of that, he doesn't live in fear. He says, I will rejoice. I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit, Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. He says, you know what? I'll either die or live next week, but either way I'm going to be delivered. I wonder if you and I can, can you know, live that kind of, you know, whatever happens tomorrow, I'm in Christ. I'm delivered. We're promised deliverance, so to speak. Secondly, 
as it is my eager expectation hope that I will not be all ashamed, but that with full courage now as always Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. You know, it amazes me that Paul says, I hope that I live up to my encounter with the most powerful man in the world. He says, I hope I don't make you ashamed of me. Really? He gets scared sometimes in Jerusalem. One night he's scared and God appears to him to encourage him. Even the Apostle Paul, uh, one of the most courageous people I know, he had down days. And he says here, while he's awaiting trial next week, you know, I hope you're not going to be ashamed of what I do, what I say. He's probably going to have about, you know, 10 minutes, 15 minutes before to give his apology, his defense in front of the emperor, uh, who he is and what he believes. And I wonder if the emperor is going to listen. By the way, the emperor is not interested in religion at all. He's interested in power, sheer power. And then he concludes with uh, this, and we'll conclude tonight. You know, for me, to live is Christ. To die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I don't know how you read that, but let me make sure you understand. He doesn't have a death wish. He's not saying, I'm tired of this. I'd just like to go. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is, if you're in Christ, you don't need to fear death. Now, we fear dying, maybe, the process of, you know, but not, not death because we have assurance. We have knowledge. We know what's happening. What Paul's saying here is, you're threatening me with penalty of death? I get to go home. I get to go home. You can't threaten me with that. By all accounts, four years from now, from this letter, Paul will be executed. On the third mile marker of the Austrian road, Romans will arrest him again. And they will do what they do to Roman citizens, give him a quick death, sword right across the neck. But this is 61. This is four years before. He doesn't know that. You and I know that. And what he says on this day, for me to live is Christ die gain. What that means is if I wake up tomorrow morning or if my trial tomorrow goes and I'm released, I'm going to come see you, I'm going to hug you, and what I will know is that the rest of my days I meant to serve the kingdom, serve my Lord, serve my Savior. That's what I'm supposed to do. How's your faith? Sometimes we need tests or trials. Paul seems to be doing just fine. Thank you very much. Is going to be fine. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Would you pray with me, please? Father in heaven, thank you for this Wednesday night. Thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to be together. Thank you for this congregation and its faith and its works. Bless them to grow. Help them to carry the kind of passion that Paul carries and the kind of assurance that he has as he faces the complexity of life and death. Father, help us to be strong. This we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.